Hello! I've got a different one for you today because as you can see, I'm standing in front of the official vehicles of the Beverly Hills AYSO. From New York to Miami, Dallas to Los Angeles, Moscow to Abu Dhabi to Liechtenstein, wherever there's a large concentration of wealth, you have a bunch of confused rich dudes unsure of whether or not to buy a Range Rover or a Mercedes-Benz G-Wagon. On this episode of Head to Head, we find out which uber luxury six-figure SUV they should buy. So here we are in the Mercedes-Benz G63 AMG, or as we've affectionately taken to calling it, the Mordwagen, which is German for murder wagon. Uh, because this thing is so black. How much more black, Spinal Tap might ask? I would say none more black. In fact, our camera guys have been bitching and moaning about it all day that this car is sucking up every ounce of light there is. Not only because of the matte paint, but because it's just so evil. It is primitive, I gotta point that out. The G-Wagon first showed up in 1979, and I know from reading your comments that this truck is older than the great majority of you. This is a very old school approach to off-roading. Old, however, doesn't make it bad. You don't need a lot of fancy electronics and electrically locking differentials and brake actuated this and off-road modes and adjustable air suspension when you have a ladder frame with a heavy steel body bolted to it and three locking differentials with low gears. And when all three are locked up, it is unstoppable. Now, one of the reasons I wanted to do this particular head-to-head -head was because when Justin Bell and I did our little Swedish excursion in the G65, this car's big brother, um, it appeared as if we got the car stuck in snow. And we did get the car stuck, and it was in snow. But what we actually did was we high-centered it. That means that there was so much snow underneath it, the tires couldn't make contact with anything. Hence, the truck was stuck, and we had to tow it out. That was user error. It had nothing to do with the capability of the truck. And so this is an attempt to rectify that. When you're driving the G63 off-road, you are overcome with the sense of unstoppability, imperiousness, if you will. It just doesn't feel as if anything can slow this truck down. And very, very little can. While it is very good off-road, it's not perfect. A couple of the flaws it has, the turning radius is huge. Huge. Um, I'm finding myself in this car more so than the Range Rover having to reverse back up a hill just to make a U-turn. Which, you know, okay, it's slower, but depending on the angle you're at could actually maybe not end so well. The other thing that we haven't really had a problem with yet, but it's just been scaring me to death, are those side pipes. Now, we've been lucky that the breakaway angle of the truck, we've been missing them, but there's been a few times where I really thought, oh man, we're just going to smash those side pipes if you're buying this truck to go off-road at lose the side pipes get some kind of aftermarket something or other so we're heading to a pretty good obstacle it's a real torture test for uh, I'd say most off-roaders I'd also say there's very few production off-roaders uh, that can make it a lot of products made by Land Rover could make it a Jeep Cherokee Grand Cherokee could probably make it I know a Wrangler could make it for sure and I'm gonna go ahead and say that I know this thing can make it. I'm gonna do a few things, so I'm gonna turn on the uh, low range gears. So I gotta put it in neutral, okay, low range on. I'm gonna request the differential. So what you do is you hit one for the center diff, two for the rear diff, three for the front diff, and you get these yellow lights. And what these do is they let you know that it's thinking about it. And once you're in drive and start going, they will then hopefully turn into red lights which means that the differentials have been activated and locked. And now I'm gonna drive through this, which is nuts. But you see what a stout off-road machine the G-Wagon is. It's just crazy that a production vehicle can do this sort of thing. And of course, with the twin turbo V8, I have all the torque in the known universe to get me over whatever obstacle is bothering the front wheels. Compared to the Range Rover, one of the things I really do like about this G, and all Gs, is how narrow the car is, which, okay, yeah, you don't have as much room, maybe on a long trip it's not as comfortable, um, but when you're off-road, smaller is actually better. You want a narrower car because you can fit between rocks better. Oh, look at this, it just Billy goes right up. 
The other thing is it has a feeling of solidity, but I can't think of another production vehicle that can compete with it. I mean, maybe a Unimog, but short of that, it's such a great feeling truck. You have such a sense of security, which is probably why all those soccer moms like driving them. You feel like you could drive through a riot after a Lakers playoff win, and no one would be able to touch you, let alone flip your car over and light it on fire because you would have already crushed them to death. The G-Wagon really and truly is one of the most capable production vehicles on the face of the earth. Of course, so is the Range Rover. And now here I am in the Range Rover, as in the Range Rover, not the Range Rover Sport, not the Evoque, the Big Daddy. Like the G-Wagon, this thing costs well over $100,000. What do you get for all that cash? Well. Uh, you get one very capable off-road truck, as it turns out. People that are fans of Land Rover, they know how good these things are off-road. People that aren't, they'd be shocked to know how capable a Range Rover is, but they're Range Rovers. I mean, that's what they do. You also get a 5-liter supercharged V8, just like the last one. It's actually quicker 0-60 to 60 than the G-Wagon is. This thing does it in 4.6 seconds, which I believe makes it the very fastest vehicle on earth with a low range transfer case. Think about that. Also much larger than the G-Wagon, much more comfortable, much better for a long trip. This thing from the get go has been designed to be a luxury car. And I mean, yes, I am using the word car because it's very car-like in its interior. The seats are almost beyond comfortable, heated and cooled. The whole time I've been talking to you, I've been getting a massage. The headrests, you've got to actually experience these to understand them, but they are as comfortable as a Citroen seats. That's how good they are. Unlike the G-Wagon, which is body on frame, the Range Rover here is a unibody, though it does have unitized frame rails as well as subframes. The result is instead of feeling like a block of granite and lead, it feels pretty light. In fact, Land Rover is claiming they're using so much aluminum in this new Range Rover that it's up to 800 pounds lighter than the vehicle it's replacing. We actually weighed this sucker, 5,500 pounds, meaning that if it was actually 800 pounds lighter, the old Range Rover would have weighed 6,300 pounds, which it totally didn't. The Range Rover does feel as if it's about 1,000 pounds lighter than the G-Wagon, which is both good and bad. Obviously, the lighter a car is, the more nimble and sprightly it handles. However, there's something so wonderful about the way the G-Wagon feels that the extra weight just adds to it. All right, so now we're in low range. So I'm gonna attempt that same crazy frame bending obstacle that we just did in the G63. Let's see how the old Range Rover here does. This is really causing the vehicle to work. Full articulation, all-wheel drive system. Whoa, <laughs> it's doing its best. That was a crazy shift. But it does it, it gets through. Now I've got to make this big left turn and run up a block of concrete. Can I do it? No problem whatsoever. I'm in awe of what we just went over in this thing. And that is a funny difference between the Range Rover and the G-Wagon. In the G63, it went through that and I wasn't surprised because duh, it should. Whereas with the Range Rover, I'm like, whoa, it just did that? It just goes to show just how purpose-built and old school that G-Wagon feels. Here we are bounding up a hill, no problem whatsoever, especially because we're in low gears. And again, we're experiencing full wheel articulation here. One of the differences might be that since the G is so mechanical, it just kind of goes, whereas in the Range Rover, the computer's thinking a little bit. Right now I have it in auto. No, I do have uh, five different off-road modes. I've just been told, leave it in auto and let the computer figure out what's going on. There is no locking front or rear differential, but the Range Rover uses its brakes just like a locking differential. So if one of the wheels is losing power, it can stop it, and then that sends all the power to the wheel that still has traction. One thing that makes it very easy to off-road with are all these cameras it has. So now we're using something called the curb view. And I'm using this because I'm about to go between two rocks. However, because the rocks are only about wheel height, once I'm in them, I can't really tell where they are unless I have these cameras on. And then I can plainly see there's the body of the Range Rover. There's the rocks. 
but I can just go ahead and slowly, because that's the key to good off-roading, slowly maneuver between them. Boom, no problem whatsoever. This car also has air suspension, which is great because not only does it make it smoother and more comfortable when you're on the road, but when you're off-road, you just hit this little button and it jacks the vehicle up. There's two off-road heights. There's your first setting, then your second setting, which is higher. And if you really need a little bit more just to get over one obstacle, hold the brake and then hold this button for three seconds. It'll give you like an extra 60 millimeters or something. And you can have that up to like three miles an hour over that car's too top heavy so it lowers back down to ride height two. So the G-Wagon has fixed suspension. Now that said, the G-Wagon has plenty of wheel articulation as is. Maybe it doesn't need the air suspension, although it is a nice feature to have in the Range Rover. So the question then becomes, which is better off-road? And man, is that close. I think that the Range Rover, at the end of the day, would be able to do more because of all the off-road modes, because of the adjustable suspension, and because of these cameras, you can really position the vehicle where it needs to be. So by the hair of its chinny chin chin, I'm gonna give the off-road victory to the Range Rover. And now I'm back in the Range Rover, but instead of a grueling off-road course, I've come to the mean streets of Beverly Hills. Why? Well, for one, this is Range Rover country. The other reason is, a buddy of mine, Steve, years ago did this art project where he filled up the back of a pickup truck with mud, got a bunch of his artist friends, and they came down to Rodeo Drive, took off all their clothes, covered themselves in mud, and then zombie walked down Rodeo. So this is my little homage to him. And that's why we didn't bother to watch either the Range Rover or the G-Wagon. By the way, we've already seen about five G-Wagons this morning. Riding around on this air suspension, it's just so calm, so quiet. You have no idea that you are driving one of the very fastest SUVs in the world. This thing is quite impressive. G-Wagon. And how does this new Range Rover compare to the old one? Well, if I'm honest, I gotta tell you, it's pretty similar. The last Range Rover was developed when Range Rover and Land Rover were owned by BMW, and that car had some residual BMW-ness. This vehicle was partially developed under the watchful eye of Ford. And there is a lot of Ford going on here. For instance, I've got this full haptic screen. Uh, if I wanna change the radio stations, I've got to find the audio video menu. Missed it the first time, now I hit it, then I gotta find a, a button to tune, missed it again. For $115,000, I want a knob. I wanna be able just to scroll through my stations. And you can't do that here. Also, some of the controls are a little, I don't know, for a, an SUV this expensive, this refined, this top of the food chain, it just feels not as nice as the rest of the car. Turn signal stock's incredible. I love the TFT screen. The steering wheel's great, but overall, it's a bit of a mixed bag. Driving around Beverly Hills here, it just makes sense. You understand why every other car that I'm looking at right now is a Range Rover. You can't say the same thing for the G-Wagon. So while the Range Rover was totally at home in Beverly Hills, the G-Wagon is not. It drives around sort of as if it's depressed, like, like there's a war going on somewhere and no one bothered to invite it. It's just, it's a military vehicle. And it feels that way driving it. Everything is just needs a little more effort than a luxury car should have. It's a little more cumbersome. Despite all that power and torque, it's a little bit slower than you might imagine. It's not your typical Beverly Hills housewife mommy mobile. I mean, listen to these door locks. It's like you're driving around a fortress. Is it bad that so many of these vehicles are running around places like Beverly Hills? You know, we were talking earlier saying, how many owners do you think have ever locked all three differentials? More importantly, how many owners do you think know how to? The number we came up with is zero, as in none of them. And that's okay. But as my colleague Allison Harwood, the editor of Truck Trend pointed out, thanks to wealthy people buying trucks like this, they still make them. Remember, in 2006, Mercedes wanted to get rid of the G in the US. That's the year they introduced the GL, which was supposed to replace the old military truck. Thing is, the demand was so high that they are now selling the G side by side with the GL. I think that's a good thing because the world needs more hardcore off-road vehicles, 
Which brings us back to the Range Rover. In every measurable way, the Range Rover is a better product. It's $30,000 cheaper. It's faster. It's more comfortable. It rides better. It has a more luxurious interior. It has more technology in it. Which is why the winner of this week's head-to-head -head is the Mercedes-Benz G63 AMG. Forget about your brain. Listen to your heart. This is the car I want. After spending days with both of them, the Range Rover is great. It's a wonderful product. But the G is the one tugging at my heartstrings. I'm standing here in front of my favorite restaurant in Los Angeles, Providence. And I'm not alone because this is one of the very few two Michelin star restaurants in the city. I happen to be very lucky because I'm good friends with the chef and owner of Providence, Michael Simarusti. But the reason we're here is because they have a particularly wealthy clientele. And I've brought out Luca Bruno, who's the maitre d' here, to talk a little bit about cars. So Luca, I want to ask you, if both the Range Rover and the G63 showed up and you only had one spot out front, which one would you park? Is the uh, Mercedes AMG G63. No, why? Why the Mercedes? Because it looks really slick. <laughs> it does look really yeah. slick. Okay, very good. Now, I have one other question. Um, our boss, Angus McKenzie, he always says that the Range Rover is the only vehicle that can show up at the opera caked in mud and it'll still get parked out front because that's okay. Range Rovers are supposed to be dirty. If either of these two cars showed up dirty, how would, would that be okay or would you want them cleaned? Oh no, of course. Our valet manager can wash it while you're having your dinner. Okay, excellent. 